Hello, welcome back to Aethros Space 11.33. Things tiny, things huge. We are back. Nice. Guys, we're ready. Uh, for some Aether. Oh. Is this a new character? I uh, know, we've met this person before. Is he one of the beasts? Yeah. He's... I thought he died. Did you meet him? Wasn't he the armadillo man that got, like, no, crucified? Belias. So he's the last one? He's the last one. <laughs> As Wolfram of the... Was that the guy with the funny monkey heel stand? Uh, no. Oh, okay. Who was that then? They had like a sloth Ted. or a monkey that healed? What, that guy's dead? It was Ted. Ted, okay, thank God. As Wolfram of the... <laughs> what, what's Ted of the... He's back home. He's back on XK. <laughs> Ted of the XK. <laughs> <laughs> As Wolfram of the White ran across the ruined ground, carrying Del said in his hands, he wept bitter tears. In the end, he hadn't been able to do anything. He'd been there for the entire fight between Belias, Del said, and that Karen woman, and all he'd done was watch. He thought he'd be he'd thought he was better than that, stronger. He'd thought that he was a grown up. Belias had been cut to bits and he just stood there shaking in his boots. You should stay here, kiddo. Miss Lily had said, back on Hex K, before he'd stowed away on their ship. Grow up a little first, yeah? He should have listened. He should have listened. If he wasn't going to be any help anyway, why did he even bother coming here? Wolfram looked down at Delsed, resting in his palms like a doll. They hadn't managed to get far after their fight before collapsing from exhaustion and pain. He knew he had to get them to a doctor sooner, or else they might die. Where could he find a doctor? A medic or whatever? Wolfram was sure someone had said, but he hadn't been listening. Stupid, stupid! He'd have to be careful, too. To make moving Delsad easier, he'd used his guardian entity, Byako, to shrink them down to the size of an action figure. Oh no, this is like a JoJo plot. <laughs> We're putting them in the turtle. <laughs> Wolfram didn't really get it, but apparently when something tur tiny turned big all of a sudden, there was a big explosion of force from all the space that suddenly got taken up. Wolfram had tried using that against Paradise Karen, unshrinking a rock and a glove to hit her with the blast of force, but he hadn't had the guts to do anything more. He just watched while his friend got cut to pieces. He should have done more. He could have done more. In the distance, Wolfram could see another pod coming down, the first in a while. He ignored it. He understood now that he wasn't cut out for this thing called war. In the end, all a coward like him could do was run away. No! <laughs> Wolfram of the... I'm so sorry... He was like 10, he so <laughs> understandable. What? He was a little kid. What? Why is he here? Because <laughs> the supremacy culture is fucked up. But is XK a supremacy planet? Well, it, the whole thing's fucked up. It's a Fox galaxy. <laughs> Guys, don't go to the supremacy part of the universe. <laughs> oh my goodness gracious. The vermin kept crawling up one after another. As the hanged man plunged its fist down, the bear I see you learned. <laughs> the baron little Lady de Fleur leapt backwards, a single pitchfork half protruding from his back to pull him along. As he skidded to a halt on the ruined ground, the pitchfork retreated back within his spine, returning its power to him. He didn't have time to relax. While his attention was focused on the hanged man, the skin dragon swooped in behind him, its wings of epidermis sweeping up everything in their path. Ludalay barely had time to fire off a pitchfork up into the sky before he was enveloped by the blood-moistened blanket. It was an awful sensation. The skin wrapped itself around his body, squeezing tight as a vice, even as it tried to force itself down his throat. Even for the few seconds he was restrained, it was utterly unbearable. Damnation in Vidya! The flash of red was barely visible from within the cocoon of skin, but the Baron vanished and a second later reappeared up in the sky, taking the place of the pitchfork he just shot out. <clears throat> that, too, had been anticipated. The moment he teleported, the hanged man threw a titanic punch at him, clearly intending to smear him with a single blow. As if that could ever happen. Nunale writhed in the air and kicked the incoming fist, instantly obliterating it, huge droplets of liquid metal flying in every direction. At the same time, he swiped his arm behind him, generating a wave of air pressure that sent the skin dragon flying away. Breathing room was difficult to come by these days, but so long as the Baron could hit his opponents, he had no doubt he could kill them. The hanged, the hanged man staggered back, the stump of its arm high in the air, but then lunged forward again. 
The arm changed shape as it was thrust towards Lunalay, stump sharpening into a blade, tip pointed towards the glowing hole in the Baron's chest. That only made sense. It was the closest thing to a weak point he possessed. Damnation Ira! An explosion of heat and light burst forth from Lunalay's body, slowing the incoming blade just a fraction, and Lunalay used the opportunity well. Landing on the hesitant limb, he began running along its surface, towards the head. Spikes sprouted up from the forearm beneath, trying to impale him, but his speed and maneuverability was such that he was able to weave around them. Even as he did so, though, his mind raced. Again, it was two enemies. The person piloting the hanged man, one of the Arcana Automatics, and the man with the skin ability. Lulay recognized the latter, one of the Oliphant clan, the criminal simpleton Roy Oliphant Dawkins. To think even they were involved in this madness... In the end, though, it didn't matter who they were. They would die. What that matters is our plan. <laughs> it's all, you know, it all goes to shit when the, when the villain's like, no matter, <laughs> they will simply be squished. That's all my JRPG energy gets poured into Lunoi. <laughs> <laughs> that simple fact had been set in stone since these two had chosen to make the Baron Ludelay de Fleur their enemy. Three. Little Lay threw himself to the side right before a branch would have speared into the hole in his chest. A spear-like tendril of wood had suddenly emerged from the omnipresent fog, and as Little Lay backed up, he saw three more writhe forth, pulling their master along. Little Lay's eyes narrowed. This was impossible. He was absolutely certain he'd taken Morgan knocked out of the fight. Four flexible branches cracked and clicked in the air, protruding from Nacht's back where they'd burst free, blood dripping from their roots as they carried him like spider legs. At first, Noct seemed like some kind of puppet, hanging limply with his head low, until he looked up. If anything, though, that was worse. Some kind of moss had grown over his eyeballs, turning his gaze green and blank, and similarly, green veins seemed to be spreading all under the skin of his face. A horror to behold. What devilry is this? Lunalay snarled. By way of answer, Noct did two things. First, he opened his mouth and an unearthly, incoherent groan poured forth. Then he attacked, branches pummeling Lunalay with all the speed of a machine gun. The Baron was able to block the blows each and all, of course, but the speed of the bout was such that he had no chance to counterattack. The metal beneath them shifted, and before Lunalay could react, he'd been struck by a punch from the hangman's other fist. The damage was superficial, cracks across his stone skin, but he was sent flying all the same, body flipping end over end from gravity's cruel whim. He didn't go far. At the moment Lunalay was struck, Nock thrust one of his branches forward, and with a spark of green aether, that branch instantly grew into a mighty tree, engulfing and constraining Lunalay. The Baron's body was held tight between mighty roots, strong as iron, closely packed enough that he couldn't even wiggle his fingers. The only part of him visible was his head, eye glaring from between a parting in the foliage. No, 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 this isn't happening. I refuse. This is not happening. No, 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 no. This wasn't my turn, that's why. Morgan nuts. <laughs> Mouth cracked open as he looked up at Lunalai, and with an obviously great effort, he roared out, Now! Next to him, the hanged man moved to crush him between its palms. Above him, the skin dragon was twisted into an epidermal spear and hurled down by its rider. All around him, the branches tightened, choking his life away. Death knocked three times! And then, a miracle occurred. Behind the hanged man, the pyramid at the center of the battle suddenly erupted into flames, an explosion consuming it utterly, rubble flying in every direction. Nulay knew not the cause, nor did he care. The only thing that mattered was that the attention of the three killing him was diverted for a single moment. That single moment was all he needed. The tree around him was still attached to Nark, wasn't it? The source of it was still emerging from his back. He was its master, its father, its birthplace. It was a part of his body. And so it was the simplest thing in the world. With a <coughs> of his tongue, Lunalay released another pitchfork from his body, and it impaled the tree the second it emerged from his form. Immediately he saw Nacht freeze, green eyes wide. And at the same time, he felt a new surge of power rush into him. Felt new spaces and capacity opening up. Aether Battery! The last one he'd needed. 
Among the special officers of the supremacy, there were three people said to be closest to the power of the contenders. Dorothy Iroh, who could command the world around her with a word. Palatine, the inhuman leftovers of an Aether Awakening. Wait, what? Can we get some lore on that? <laughs> Maybe in the future. <laughs> And the Baron Lunalet de Fleur, who wielded strength overwhelming. Crimson Aether screamed. Alright, popcorn. Roy Oliphant Dawkins felt it, a chill running down his spine as he rode the spear down, giving him warning enough to pull back and keep his distance. Iona Yggdrasil felt it, was powerless to react as an alien consciousness took hold of it. All it could do was watch as the Baron was consumed by flooding red energy. Scout Oliphant Dawkins, within the cockpit of the hangman, felt it. And as that red light surged over everything, he raised the arms to the Arcana automatic defensively. Ruth Blaine, next to him, slowly opened her eyes, just in time to see a nightmare flood into her brain. How are you going to get this in Royal I'll find a way. (laughs) (laughs) No greater grief than to remember days of joy when misery's at hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight... Nine damnation vanagloria, where we came forth and once more saw the stars. Is this the ninth deadly sin? This is. <laughs> you mentioned oh, this no. is the strongest one before. No. <laughs> as soon as the black and red vision cleared, Ruth put a hand to her head, groaning. What was going on? The last thing she remembered was fighting that special officer in the forest. Now she was here in some kind of slimy metal pod, her body screaming with pain. Was this the inside of the hanged man? What the hell? It was only when Scout Elephant Dawkins spoke that she realised he was next to her. She followed his horrified gaze, looking at a round monitor that seemed to be displaying a shot of the outside world. Her eyes widened as she saw it too. A suit of pitch black armour, titanic as it stretched up into the sky, so huge that the hanged man barely reached its waist. All across its body, beatific faces and caressic limbs were carved, as if a cathedral had gotten up and started walking. Jagged spikes protruded from its joints, sharp as knives, and a massive leathery cape flapped in two pieces like bat wings behind it. Great lightning bolts of red aether ran along the entirety of its huge body, each large enough to dwarf a human being. The beast had no head. Instead, above the termination of the neck, there was a great red star. All of the crimson light coming together into a single spherical mass. There, floating in the midst of the confluence, was the Baron himself. The raging light made him little more than a silhouette, the iris of a giant eye. His face could not be seen, but when he spoke it was as if he was standing right next to them. Be gone. No! He brought his mech. That's his, uh, if he was a Smash character, that's his final yeah. Smash. This guy has like five final Smashes. <laughs> no, a special would be like some Steve bullshit where he throws the pitchforks out and then his other specials manipulate them. <laughs> it was as his consciousness faded in and out, memories, blemry and dis- memories blurry and distorted, as if they were being filtered through a layer of water. His head was filled with alternating pain and emptiness. One second he was slicing up away at the last ex executioner, and the next he was barely being carried through the woods on someone's back. You alive? Marcus Grace asked from beneath him, his voice calm and professional, even as they charged through the charred ruins of the forest. You awake? Wait, who's who's Marcus Grace? Uh, that was Winston's dad who saved him as he last we saw. Oh, Edward was his grand. Yeah. Mm. Yes, Mizazi tried to say that, but all he managed was a weak croak. Even so, Marcus seemed to accept it. Hang in there. Don't die. We're on our way to a special officer of medical specialization. She'll be able to stabilize you. Understand? It was difficult to understand with his head so full of fog, but Tony Mizazi did his best. He ran every word through his head again and again until the noise acquired meaning, and the second it all became clear, he nodded with another wheeze. It took much longer than it should have. The world crawled close and withdrew again and again, like a videograph being turned on and off and on and off. Each image was different, each instant of shattered consciousness presenting a new horror. A hill of charred corpses, mouths frozen in the last screams. Anastasia Dark Dancer, impaled on her own hoverboard, nailed to a tree by it. A river of human mincemeat, men and women hanging from steel nooses. An inhuman monster, all extra limbs and heads peppered by countless shards of broken glass. The dead, prepared for viewing in every way imaginable. He knew what he was looking at. This was war. This was his supremacy engaging an honourable combat for its pride. This is what legends were written about. It thought this glorious? 
It seemed like an age, but he was finally laid out on the floor before a young woman with teal hair and sunglasses. She ran a medical script over him and then inspected the screen, her brow furrowing concern. When she spoke, it was to Marcus, not the infirm Muzazi. He's almost out of the golden hours for his face, she said seriously with a slight lisp. Do you have any panacea? My face, Muzazi vaguely wondered. What does she mean, my face? All he could feel from his face was a strange no, no, warm... No, no, no. <laughs> what are you doing to him? <laughs> All he could feel from his face was a strange warm wetness and a sting of pain where the wind brushed against it. He couldn't even see out of one eye. He'd have gone up to look for himself, but the strength escaped him. Marcus shook his head above Muzazi. No, don't you? The doctor rubbed the bridge of her nose with her fingers. There's been goddamn meteors coming down, Mark. People are fucked. In a situation like this, it's first come, first served. Marcus clicked his tongue. Well, is there anything you can do for him? The doctor shrugged her shoulders, and two thin white tendrils appeared from behind her back, tipped with syringes of strange blue liquid. Before Muzazi could so much as register what he was looking at, the tendrils lunged in, stabbing into his arms and chest, arm and chest as they slowly deposited their payload. Slowly, slowly, he could feel some semblance of strength flowing back into him. This'll stabilize him and get him on back on his feet for a while, the doctor explained. We do anything for his injuries, though. What will you do? Muzazi heard a click as Marcus reloaded his pistol. I'm going back out there. I'm going to check out the situation in the pyramid. Last I heard, the hellhound was meant to be hiding in there. Doctor scoffed. The thing blew up, didn't it? If the hellhound's there, he's buried under all that rubble. Plus, there's no way anyone's getting down to that barrier anymore, right? Sounds like it, Marcus said, holstering his pistol. Still, we've got to check. Look after him. Can I uh, popcorn to you for this last bit? Mm-hmm. Mm. Sorry. Ah! <clears throat> I was totally ready. <laughs> With that, Marcus ran off into the burnt-up woods again without so much as a glance backwards. The doctor shook her head ruefully as she watched him go, before looking back down at Muzazi. This should just take a minute more, she said reassuringly. Sorry I can't do more, but forcible act ability deactivation. The strength pouring into Muzazi's body suddenly stopped, and the doctor's tendrils disintegrated into peach aether. Surprised, she looked up, reaching for a tiny pistol strapped to her leg. What? She said she did not have time for anything else. Bang! And the doctor flew back as a bullet tore through her head, leaving a small hole in her forehead and a much bigger one in the back of her skull. Killed instantly, she crumpled to the ground, aether sparking weakly around her body before dying off completely. You're a hard man to find, a toy Muzazi, said in an unfamiliar voice. With the strength the doctor had managed to provide him, Muzazi was able to twist his body around to look at the speaker. His vision took a moment to focus. A man was walking towards him, the bells that hung from his wide-brimmed hat jingling with each step. One hand rested leisurely in his pocket, while the other held a revolver, pointed directly at Muzazi. Muzazi had never met this fellow, but he knew of him. That distinctive dress couldn't be mistaken. Seth Harrowing. So another special officer wanted him dead. Another supposed ally was angling for his back. A toy Muzazi couldn't bring himself to be surprised anymore. Nothing personal. Seth grinned, a sleazy grin on his face as he advanced. But you're real good at making enemies, friend. With a buzz of white aether, Muzazi ignited the radiant on one hand as he rose to one knee. He wouldn't go down without a fight. Seth just raised an amused eyebrow. Forcible ability deactivation, he said, and the radiant sputtered out. Sorry, but I heard scary stories. Not giving you a chance here, champ. That's short for champion. No! <laughs> you can't just pour Bradley! You can't just pour Bradley in here. What the... <laughs> is that what he would say? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Muzazi glared, eyes narrowed in utter hatred. You could only kick a man for so long. You could only kick a man for so long! I actually got a request this time. Seth grinned. That's a... F that's a first. She wanted me to show you this before the end. The gunslinger closed his eye, took a deep breath, and beige aether began to surge around him, his revolver gl glowing like a supernova. When he opened his eyes once again, they were shining too, as wide and bright as the headlights of a car. Oh, see, it's full circle, because Muzazi threw a car once. <laughs> Do you remember? In in yeah, it's the revenge of the car. <clears throat> Fusion tool! 
he roared, hat flying off from the boiling pressure around him. Revelation! Six chakra! The light died. The pressure stopped. The aether faded. Uh-huh, said Seth. And as he did so, blood began to pour from his mouth. Oh my god, he just got samurai movie slashed. No. <laughs> It took him a second to realize that Muzazi had disappeared from the spot he'd just been looking at. Slowly, he looked down. Oh. There he was. Muzazi had crossed the distance between the two of them in an instant and rammed his fist through Seth's chest, smashing through his ribcage and organs. As Seth watched, held upright only by pain, Muzazi tore his arm free, the limbs soaked with blood. But, Seth whispered, Your ability! Ah! Get lost, Muzazi growled. And then his fist came again, shining white. This time aimed for Seth's face. Did he invent a new ability? No, he just used his Aether Infusion. His Aether what? The Infusion is like normal Aether usage. Oh, reinforce, yeah. you mean. The last thought that passed Seth Harrowing's mind as the strike obliterated his brain was that this job really hadn't been worth the money. Two bodies dropped to the ground. One was dead, the other very nearly so. For a good few minutes, Muzazi just stared up at the sky, his breathing laboriously slow. A toy Muzazi had already promised himself. He'd never show his back again. He rose to his feet and, ignoring the pain, started staggering through the woods. He still had enemies here. He still had things to do. No, Muzazi, you have no enemies. <laughs> Muzazi! Maria's crying. She's crying right now in heaven. Can you believe it? <laughs> Oh, man. Give me a sec. I have Aether questions. Okay. I, ho I hope you don't mind. It's fine. <laughs> Always happy to help. Alright. So. I have a question. Mm hmm So gene tyrants, they can turn their bodies into whatever they want. Yeah. They can change their cells. Can they un-gene tyrant themselves? And I don't mean, like, just take a normal human form. Like, can they make it so they're no longer a gene tyrant? They technically could, but... Whether they would is another story. Right. Next question. Um, is it common to have secret labs or factories on Lilith Worlds, like conspiracy theory style? What do you mean? So, like, if you if someone was, like, trying to have, like, oh, this is where we store intelligence or where we work on new weapons testing or something, but they don't want, like, spies to pick it up because there's umbrance everywhere, man. Would they put it on, like... Would it be not uncommon for them to put it on a Lilith world and for there to be, like, all kinds of conspiracy theories about it? Like, ooh, what are they doing on XK... in XK forests? Uh, Lilith worlds are usually ones that haven't been, like, rediscovered, so it'd be pretty rare, I'd say. Oh, okay. For, like, to be a known no Lilith world. So once, once they find a Lilith world, that's usually when it's no longer the Lilith worlds. I thought Lilith worlds were intentionally kept around so they could just pluck warriors from them. No, not necessarily. Hmm. Oh, God. They're the ones that at least, oh. like... Civil societies that have fallen out of contact with the rest of the galaxy. That's a shame. Alright. Well, thank you for watching. Thank you for an unforgettable luncheon. I wanted more Skipper and Supreme, but this was pretty good. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. This was pretty good. No greater grief than to remember days of joy when misery is at hand. Is that like a reference to something? Yeah, it's old Dante's Inferno. <laughs> Ah, oh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine! Damnation, Vangloria! I had to do it as Hamilton, I don't know why. Or Hamilton, I mean. My favorite mus musical, Hamilton. Did Hamilton. we watch Hamilton? We did. <laughs> that was good. Alright, bye! Bye!